uh, this evening is uh, March 20th, it's 2013, and uh, our message this evening is called Radical Amputation. Turn to Deuteronomy 19, we're going to be in the 11th verse. Our message tonight will be pretty straightforward, but uh, I promise it will be one of the practical messages that will bless you. Deuteronomy 19 and 11. But if a man hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him, assaults and kills him, then he goes on to say, and flees to one of these cities. I realize that I'm quoting a verse without giving you the context. It's because I need to refer to a principle that was so commonplace in Hebrew culture that they understood it much the same way that we would understand linear thought. A plus B equals C. I mean, I don't have to explain that to you, but you realize that that makes absolutely no sense? A plus B equals C makes absolutely no sense. Those are letters, they're not numbers. But it's a concept that we understand so that you can fill in the blank. In Judaism, there is a concept of escalation. Now that's not what they call it, it's what I've named it. And it goes like this, if a man hates his neighbor, that leads to lying in wait for him, which leads to assaulting him, which leads to killing him. So hate is equal to killing, because hate, if you dwell in it, will produce lying in wait, which will produce an assault, which will produce murder. The idea then is that the light thing is equal to the heavy thing. And if something is true in the small, it's even more true in the bigger case. In your NIV Bibles, this often shows up with phrases in the New Testament like, how much more? If Israel's stumbling brought us life, how much more will their acceptance bring life from the dead? That how much more is equating something small like stumbling with something big like the resurrection of the dead. I want you to see how Jesus uses this. Turn with me to Matthew 5. I promise this is not a technical message tonight. We just have to get a couple of things out of the way because we don't grow up with them. By the way, if we're standing in the area of Kisi or Riancho in northern Kenya, and you say A plus B equals, they will all just stare at you. They won't have any idea because they didn't grow up in a school with linear thought the way you did. They would have never heard it. So some things that Jesus says often to us are like, wait, it's familiar, but I'm not sure exactly what he's saying. In Matthew 5, starting in verse 27, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Do you see the principle of escalation here? Mm -hmm. Looking at a woman lustfully will eventually lead you to the place where you've committed adultery. So Jesus is saying it's a done thing in your heart. This is based on the principle that we just talked about in Deuteronomy 11, or 1911. Look at verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Now technically this is something called a Calve Comer argument. It's a light and heavy argument. I'm not going to teach on it tonight because I don't want to lose you in that. But if you're very interested in Hebraic things, there's a message online called Calve Comer. And it comes up first if you Google it on... Uh, on the World Wide Web, at our little church in Sugar Lake, Texas, it's number one in the search results. Okay, so you can find that. The most plain, basic understanding of what Jesus has just said is that it is better for you to lose an eyeball than for your whole body to enter into hell. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Losing a little thing is worth saving the whole thing. Would you agree with that? How about this one? Crippled or maimed while living is worth being whole in the life to come. Now, we're used to these verses. We've heard them. We, we know when we start with gouge out an eye and immediately you're
your mind begins to equate certain things. And the first among the list is that Jesus does not really mean to gouge out your eye. Am I, am I wrong about that? As soon as we start to read it, nobody in here is, is reaching for their eyeball. As soon as we talk about cutting off a hand, nobody in here is reaching for it. I'd like you to think about this first. Actually, turn with me to Matthew 18. He says it again in Matthew 18. Maybe if we hear it more than once, it'll make a bigger impact. It's also in Luke. It's also in Mark. In Matthew 18, let's look at verse 7. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Think about this for just a second. How brutal of a statement is that? Can you imagine? Now, right now, if we pull Spencer up here, and it would take all of us, right? But if Les helped me and Charlie got out his pocket knife, and we started working on his hand, how brutal of a thing would that be? Now, if this is today, what would you do with it? You put it in a bucket of ice and you run to the ER, and God willing, there may be a chance to save it. Dave, you lost a finger one time, but they put it back on, didn't they? How many of you know that if you lost a finger in Jesus' day, it was gone? It was gone. See, and this, this really illustrates a big difference between the world of today and the world of His day. It's the same world, and yet... We put things back on that Jesus meant to be cut off. See, if you gouged out an eye to get rid of sin in your life, that was just, it was gone. But today, we would look for an implant. We would look for a prosthetic. At the very least, we would look for an eye patch so nobody knew how our eye socket looked. And if you cut off a hand, what happens? Has anybody ever been trapped in a really bad situation? We used to joke when we were kids that if we had to live with our teacher, we'd cut off our arm to get away in the morning, right? We had all these kind of sayings. Of course, nobody had ever done it. <laughs> it's an easy thing to say until it's done. There were no prosthetics in Jesus' day. So if we cut off Spence's hands, he's got to know for the rest of his life. If you cut it off today, we're going to put something on, right? What kind of attitude is Jesus teaching towards sin? How many of you can honestly say somewhere in your life you're crippled, not because of what sin's done to you? You would rather be crippled than continue to sin. Oh my goodness. Where have you imposed upon yourself a limitation? Where have you cut something off for righteousness sake? Now let's think through these. Maybe some of you are an alcoholic. And even though alcohol is not sin, drunkenness is. Maybe forever you cut yourself off from alcohol because you said, I would rather never touch alcohol again than to sin with it again. Anybody out there feel that way? Now, it's a funny thing because in America, we're used to doing this with substances, but we're not used to doing it with attitudes of the heart. We're not used to doing it with sins that are not so obvious as getting drunk. We don't do it with sins of the lust of the eye. We don't do it with sins of the pride of life. We don't do it in other areas. It's perfectly acceptable to walk away from a substance and never touch it again to not sin. But nobody throws away their computer when they watch the video that's not pleasing to God. Why? I'd like to play a video for you. I thought it illustrated a point. You may have seen me run out of worship. I ran out of worship because I had a ding, ding, ding moment, and I wanted you to see this video, okay? It's less than two minutes. I go to let the header down, and oh, darn it, I didn't, let, I didn't take the header lock off. I got to hold the header lock, and I raised it up, 
And, I, and just as I got it raised up and got it hooked into place, I felt a quick tug on my arm. I go, wow. And the next thing I know, my hand's all wrapped around this shaft. I had coveralls on this one-piece suit I had was no longer a one-piece suit anymore. It was all wrapped around the shaft. I'm looking at my hand, I go, Pat, that hand, the only way you're gonna get loose is to rip your hand off. And, and, and I go, I don't know if I can do that. By this time, it's been at least probably five minutes, and this shaft's pulling and pulling and pulling. And I go, I'm gonna run out of energy if I don't get out of here soon. I, I have only one option, I gotta rip my hand off. So I just kept pulling and pulling as hard as I could, and all of a sudden, my hand just, just pulled right off my ball, off my body. And what is it slid off the end, it was like a, it's like a suction sound, and I could feel the cold, it felt cold when it was running over the ends of the bone. My body is still stuck to this shaft, because all the clothes that I had on, I mean, I had, you know, full coveralls on, they were all wrapped around my waist. I pushed as hard as I could, and I go, I don't think I'm gonna make it. I go, God help me, and I said, God help me again. And just as I said that, I could feel felt like I had hands pulling on both of my shoulders. I could smell the belt burning, and I, all I could see was this blue smoke. My eyes actually started to feel like they're starting burning. All of a sudden, I, it just released. They cut it about halfway down to my wrist. I survived because I'm not ready to go yet. And the only reason why I, I think I, I know that I made it is because I had, I had, you know, help from the other side. Ultimately, didn't this man make a critical decision? He could stay trapped in a combine for the rest of what would become his very short life. He would surely die there, a slow, agonizing death. He could see it, he understood it, and so he made a calculated decision. It was better for him to lose a hand and continue with life made than it was for his life to end at that place. I wish sin was always so obvious. The combine didn't try to deceive him in any way. The Combine didn't have a masterful demonic power that has been deceiving human beings for 6,000 years. They're saying, oh, it won't really end in death. It's just a scratch, I promise. He didn't have that. He had a decision to make, and the, the rules were clear to him. I can die now, or I can lose something and live. All oh, Christians, that we can put ourselves in that position. The devil has tricked so many of us into believing that we can live with just a little bit of sin because that little bit of sin will not kill us. But what the Jews understood that we do not understand is that a small thing eventually leads to that larger thing. And there is no stopping it. That's how a, a small root of bitterness can defile everything. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 15. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Is that pretty clear? Leave nothing living. Look at verse 7. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. Say, bad Saul. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag, bad Saul. And the best of the sheep, bad soul. And cattle, bad soul. And fat calves, bad soul. And <laughs> now I lost my place. And lambs, bad soul. Everything that was good. It occurred to me that this is the way in which we usually deal with sin. We know that it's wrong, and so we totally destroy most everything except what we still find good. And we rationalize it in our hearts. You know how you know that he was not obedient? He's going to claim he's obedient. Do you know how you know he was not obedient? When Samuel showed up, you can see it, what, about verse look, 13. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Pastor, I repent. I promise. 
But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is the lowing of cattle that I hear? You know how you know? You know because Saul was not standing there without cattle. He was not standing there without sheep. He had not really cut off anything of worth in his life. So often we're standing there saying, I repent, I repent, but I'm going to hang on to whatever it was that helped me sin just in case I change my mind in a little while. I had a friend that had a fairly prolific marijuana habit. And he went to Hawaii because his parents were people of means. And he brought back something that he deemed special. When he got born again, he threw away all of his weed except this one special bag, right? Six months into salvation is really bothering him. Because, I mean, this cost him something. He had to travel to get it. He had been protecting it all of this time. It was a work. At least he could, he could give it to somebody, you know? Cried and he poured it down that porcelain throne. He had to cut it off. He had to experience some kind of loss. As long as it was there, it was calling to him to repeat a previous sin. Oh, listen to me. How many of you can hear the bleeding of sheep in your lives? How many of you hear the lowing of the cattle? Now, I've had to be good with this message. Matthew and I sometimes hear you speaking. And we go, that is BS. It's not so Pastor Curtis, no, it's bleeding sheep. <laughs> you have not done what you said you were going to do, and it is obvious everybody can see it except you. What comes after bleeding of sheep is usually that you blame me. It happens over and over and over. You know, it's been going on since the garden. We have a problem with responsibility, especially personal responsibility. Now, would you say it's a fairly little thing to kill one man if you were supposed to kill a whole nation? I would say that's a small thing. But it led to something in Saul. It led to the tearing away of the whole kingdom. He lost his function. He lost his calling. He lost his whole life because he was not obedient in something small. I think there was a really wise rabbi one time that said, if you were faithful over a few things, you'd be given more. But if you're not faithful over a few things, even what you had would be taken from you. I would like to tell the church that we need to learn radical amputation. So often the most grievous sins have had no consequence. You know what that teaches us? That grace is cheap and we can repeat it. Now I'm not talking about beating yourself with a leather whip or putting pebbles in your shoes or crawling on your knees. I am talking about getting rid of your ways to sin. I'm going to tell you just forthrightly, some of you do not need TV sets in your homes. You are not doing anything to glorify God with them. And you're doing many things that do not glorify God. Others of you have no problem with a TV set. That's how the kingdom works. Some of you do not need alcohol anywhere around your life ever again. Some of you can have a glass of Sabbath wine every Friday night and it glorifies God. That's how the kingdom works. It's up to your master. It's up to your Lord what is permissible in your life. We've made neat little rules mostly not to be legalistic. Mostly we've done it to avoid any kind of conviction. We, saw, we call ourselves Christians because of what we don't do. But nobody's walking around maimed for the sake of the kingdom. Everybody's pretty whole, pretty intact, doing just fine, free to sin whenever they would like to sin. What if you bore on your body scars from all of those encounters that no one knows about? Would you be ashamed? You know when you wouldn't be ashamed? When the scar proved you could never do it again. Didn't Peter say he who has suffered is done with sin? Listen, saints, I'm not trying to get you to hurt yourselves or tear out your eyes. I'm simply trying to say, if your car causes you to sin, get rid of your car. If a relationship that you have is causing you to sin, don't keep pictures around. Don't keep an email address. Don't keep a key to a house. Throw it all away and do it immediately. Do you know how many people tell me I repent, but when you dig a little deeper, 
they still got an awful lot of emotional investment in whatever it is they repented from. And every once in a while they'll go, boy, when, when I was in the world, and you can see them reminiscing about Egypt. That's not radical amputation. When Jesus talked about tearing something off, cutting it off, getting rid of it, it was permanent. There was never a putting it back on. You wouldn't have the opportunity if you wanted because it was gone. Oh, saints, that's the way to deal with sin. When is sin going to be gone? When is it over? Turn with me to 1 John. Jesus understood the necessity of getting rid of sin. It sounds brutal, but it had a permanence to it. There were no prosthetics. He wanted you to know that sin should die forever. Now this is one of those verses. It's a beautiful verse. It's 1 John 1, 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I was teaching a Monday night Bible study and it occurred to me. He asks one thing of us, confession. And then He does four things. If we confess, He's faithful, He's just, He forgives, and He purifies. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Confession brings those things. But there's a lie in the American church. Because He said... If we claim that we have no sin, we're not telling the truth. We bought into this lie that says, well, then we're just all sinners. And sin becomes cheap because all we need to do is confess. Oh, friends, that's not all he wrote here, though. Let's get down to the third chapter. Let's put it in its context. Third chapter, fourth verse. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. So one who no one who lives in him keeps on sin. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. What does that tell us? Yes, if you sin, confession before him, honesty before him, brings mercy. Provided you will cut it off and walk away from it. There is no sacrifice at all for a sin you plan to commit tomorrow. It doesn't exist. Oh, it's very quiet in here. You used to love me. What's happening? <laughs> the reason that I'm telling you this is because most of the sin is not even aimed at destroying you. It will destroy you. But that's not the aim. Most of the sin is aimed, the devil is, is, is in using your evil desires to entice you away from God for this reason. When he covers you in guilt and shame, you don't feel like you can go to your father. You don't feel like you can work in your father's presence. You have no confidence to do God's will. We think that because we've sinned, he hates us. No, he stands ready to forgive us. If we will confess, he's faithful, he's just, he's forgiving, and he purifies you. He's not waiting to beat you over the head. He's waiting for you to get real with Him. But the confession has to do with cutting it off forever. Not cutting it off for. Hey, by the way, let's talk amputation for a minute. I brought my weenie dog. He's back there. That's Winston. Don't, don't leave food out. He, he's a thief. He's totally unregenerate. His character is terrible. So let's just say that we would like... Winston to change into something else. We're going to bob his ears. We're, we're going to bob his tail. Winston is now going to be a Doberman. He's going to change from a Dachshund to a Doberman. A total change of character, right? Anybody want to try it? Let's just do it and see what happens. We'll post it on, on the internet. But, but what we're going to do before we put it on Facebook is we're going to agree that we're not going to radically amputate because that's just too drastic, you know? Let's cut off his tail a slice at a time. Let's bob his ears, a razor thin strip at a time. Doesn't that sound cruel? Doesn't it sound stupid? It does, doesn't it? Do you think it sounds any less stupid when we say, well, there's no reason to throw my computer away. I'm doing it less than I used to. There, there's no reason to stop conversing with that person. We haven't sinned together in months. All you're doing is you're trying to amputate something, a razor-thin slice at a time. 
Oh, saints, that we could grow some courage and take drastic steps for God. You know, it sounds pretty radical for the king of the universe to say, tear out your eye. And he didn't say it once, but he said it twice in the book of Matthew. He also said it in Mark, and he also said it in Luke. Do you think he meant it? See, I kind of think he meant it. I think you can tell Christians by those that have intentionally maimed themselves so that they'll enter into life. Now somebody no doubt will hear this and Well, let's just, let's deal with people that are here. How about that? I would like to tell you that there's no benefit in harming your body. The benefit is in setting such strict boundaries for yourself that you walk a very narrow path. Amen. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of it. And the one who does not condemn himself by what he permits. Friends, you've been given freedom. Freedom upon freedom upon freedom. Don't use your freedom to sin. I'd like to tell you that radical amputation is not the answer to Christianity. It's a good place to start. You know, I would like to preach about it every Sunday for I don't know how many Sundays. I guess until I saw some people walking around without hands. But even if we did that, let's just say you amputated everything in your life. Now you're going to go live in a cave on top of a mountain somewhere. You're going to wear a burlap sack and, I don't know, chant Latin songs or something. Will that make you productive for the Lord? It's not enough to cut something off, friends. It's not enough just to cut something out of your life. I know Mormons that will not use caffeine. Mormons that will not eat chocolate. I know Mormons that will not do lots of things. Take off their holy undergarments. I mean, Mormons do weird things. I know Jehovah's Witness that do lots and lots of weird things. Those are the cults. I didn't even get into the Christians that are really, really restrictive. It doesn't make you a Christian. Would anybody be following Jesus if we simply had a list of things Jesus did not do? Jesus did not use the internet. Jesus never drove in a car. Jesus didn't eat crawfish. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't use air conditioning. Here in this church of Christ, Jesus never played a stringed instrument. Jesus never, 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 never. What does that have to do with the price of tea in China? You follow Jesus because of what he did. I would like to tell you that we have a God that when you take something off, he expects you to put something on in its place. Come on, say, rip it off and put something else on. Oh my goodness, if you had a stain on your garment, a nasty pute. My dachshund can help you with this. He does it all the time. He stains everything he touches. You would tear it off and you would put something else on. But when it comes to sin in our life, we just put something over it and keep going. Turn with me to Ezekiel 18. Y'all mad yet? No. Man, I kind of like y'all too. Oh, Jeremiah. Meditations. And Ezekiel. In the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, let us pick up in the 30th verse. Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all these offenses you have committed and get a new heart and new spirit. Why did the Lord of glory not tell Israel, simply stop sinning? That has never been the message. Stop sinning is not the message. You could stop sinning by just putting yourself in a prison cell. Stop sinning is not the gospel. Stop sinning and get a new heart and a new spirit. This is the gospel. So you can throw away your phone and you know what you'll do? You'll find another way to sin. You need to throw away whatever it is that is killing you and replace it with something that is godly. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. There are too many people walking around not only preserving the way that they like to sin, they are also not doing anything new. Pastor, I don't know why you're being so hard on me. I haven't done that thing for six weeks. Yes, you've done.
done nothing for six weeks. It's not enough to not sin, friends. We have to pursue righteousness. Amen. Well, you're in Ezekiel, turn to the 36th chapter. In the 36th chapter, the 24th verse. For I will take you out of the nations, and I will gather you from all the countries, and bring you back into your own land. Amen, Israel. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You can get rid of a hard heart, but if it is not replaced with a heart fashioned by God, then all you have is a basically moral person on their way to hell. We cannot approach Christianity this way. Well, I am a Christian because I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't, I don't, I don't. There are a lot of Buddhists that would never do those things either. That does not make them Christians. You become a Christian not only because of what has been cut off, but because of what has been put on in its place. Yeah. We put off the old self and we take upon us Christ. Yeah. And it is a continual process. I'm shocked at the extent to which I have to cut off in my life. I used to think that it was a sign of weakness. I now know what it is. It's a sign of strength. It actually means that you know where you are liable that you know where you are likely to sin. And so, you decide to stand in the Lord's strength and simply do without it. Oh, Christians, could we get that message? Some of you have so crippled your life, you're caught in the combine and you don't know it. You blame the combine. You blame everyone else. But you're laying there dying, trapped in it. And you don't even know what you need to cut off. The devil will do his very best to separate you through anger and bitterness. Shifting of the blame has been going on since the garden. It has never stopped. Adam first blamed his wife and then blamed God who gave him the wife. Adam can't be restored until he takes responsibility for his own situation. I beg you to ask the Holy Ghost to show you your responsibility in the situation. You know, I have done terrible things, not just many years ago, weeks ago. I was at a family event. I said things that I didn't mean to say. I don't want to say it. It's something hateful that is inside me, and I don't want it. I don't get a mile down the road, and I hear the Holy Ghost telling me what has to be cut off, how you have to humble yourself, and how you have to put something else on. It is crushing. It's heartbreaking. And it is the gospel. And there's a sense of approval of the Lord that you feel. As soon as you've been obedient. Oh, that you can know a sense of approval from the Lord. It only comes through doing difficult things, friends. God is not like Breck League or McDonald's where everybody gets a Sunday regardless of how they act. He's not. He rewards every person for the deeds that are done in the body, whether good or bad. We know that you'll be rewarded for a glass of cool water, but do you really think that's what he was talking about? Don't you think he was talking about those who walked away from their businesses, walked away from family members, lost everything for the sake of the gospel? What have you lost for the sake of the gospel? Turn with me to James the first chapter, and the 21st verse. One of our young men invited somebody not all that long ago. She said, does he always preach like that? And we, I don't think it was a compliment. She was just perplexed. She's perplexed because we are not used to having to deal with our sin. Our preachers don't even talk about it. They're obsessed with chicken cams and champions. They're obsessed with the most ridiculous things. Because we don't want to talk in terms of cut off. We want to talk in terms of expanding our tent. But let us ask, are we even faithful with what we've been given? I'm not into restriction. Is there anybody here that thinks that I'm into restriction? Legalism? I mean, most of my life I've worn the tag, the liberty pastor. But I don't want one of those liberties to cause me or anyone else to sin. 
And I would be happy to cut off anything that promotes sin, even if the thing you're cutting off is not actually sin. Where is our heart? Do you care about the person on your left and your right? More than once, I have a glass of wine. That frightens people, I know. They're so holy, they're more holy than Jesus. Jesus drank wine daily. But they're so holy, they don't. I've often given up those rights. I had people come live in my home who had alcohol issues many times, not once. I've been doing this 20 years. And when I have people in my home that have alcohol issues, we get rid of all alcohol. The terrible irony in that is me amputating something from my life doesn't amputate it from their life. They drink anyway, and then blame me for their drinking. Church, maybe somewhere we could stretch out and say, I sin before you, God, and you alone. And it's no one else's fault. It's mine. And then cut it off. I think that's the kind of confession that shows God is faithful, that shows God is just, that God is forgiving, and that God purifies. It's also the kind of confession that leads to not repeating the offense. Amen. Moving on. Carrying on in, in the Lord. Did I tell you to go to James? Let's be in the first chapter. I'm going to have to be mindful of time this evening. The first chapter in the 21st verse. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Can save you. you mean the word being planted in you alone doesn't save you? Oh, get out your black highlighters. We're going to cut something off. Just cut off the verses you don't like. Notice he doesn't just say get rid of the moral filth. He says get rid of the moral filth and accept the word. He also clarifies this just in case there would be denominations that would arise to interpret this for you. He wants to make sure that you get it right here. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. It is not enough to get rid of moral filth. You must also do what the word says. It's not enough to simply be defined by don't. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. That doesn't do a thing for us except provide a vacuum that God can fill. I beg that your life would be defined by what you do, what you do, what you do. That your faith would produce obedience. That your faith would be shown by your deeds. And a faithful deed might be that you have limited something in your life because you trust God to do more with a holy life without a computer than an unholy life with one. As a pastor, I'm so sick of talking about internet issues. I just am. If you have an internet issue, take out a sledgehammer, borrow mine, destroy your computer. Why do we have to talk about this month after month? If you have a sin issue, do whatever it takes. You know what? Then you can come into the presence of the Lord with confidence. There's a stone down here. It's built right into the stage. It says Azusa Street, 12, 12, 12. One of the brothers brought it from Azusa Street. Azusa Street was an amazing move of God at the first part of the last century. You know what it was marked by? Holiness. Prayer. Seeking God. It was not marked by sin. In fact, the men in it limited themselves. They didn't appeal to everyone based on their great charisma, the chief speaker hid behind a milk crate, glancing out with the one eye that worked. Did you hear that? With the one eye that worked. But he was holy. And the power of God fell on their knees. Let's turn with me to Romans 13. We're going to walk through a few more scriptures because the scripture will preach it better than I can. Is that okay? I hope you don't want me to tell you what you already know in a new and exciting way. I hope you came to be challenged by the Word of God. Not have your neighbor challenged by the Word or some other denomination or the chicken cam church challenged. You personally challenged. Because when I open the Word, it speaks to me about my life first. You want to know what your pastor is dealing with? 
Nine times out of ten, you can look back at the last couple hundred sermons and find it right away. We're all made of the same stuff, friends. And I will not allow myself to go to hell for a lack of cutting something out of my life. I want with all of my heart to enter into his presence and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I am going to have that. Because it is up to me. You may think it's up to the Lord, but it is not. It is up to you. The Lord already gave you everything that you need for life and godliness. It is up to you. You never could have saved yourself, but now that He has saved you, you can walk in your salvation. You can grow up in your salvation. You can eagerly desire spiritual things. Or you cannot. Blame it on God. Blame it on someone else. Finish this life with people standing at your funeral saying, I think he was a Christian. Which of course means you are most certainly not. Are you in Revelation 13? No, yeah. Romans 13. Yeah. 13, 11. Romans 13, 11. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. We could focus all day long on putting aside the de deeds of darkness and we would have a fairly, fairly moral church. One that everybody would praise. Did you know that Hitler reduced pornography? Hitler reduced crime? Did you know that Hitler improved German society for a time? And it's the worst thing that ever happened to Germany. Because while he did moral things in the beginning, he never put on Christ. Man's very best efforts to wash the pig still leaves it a pig. We have to have a change of nature. We cut off in God by His grace put something on new, beautiful, armor of light. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5. This is a scripture everyone can quote, but I wonder if you've seen it this way. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. The old has gone, the new has come. <laughs> the old is gone is not the test, friend. If the old was gone was the test, then your uncle that never accepted Jesus but quit snorting cocaine would be inheriting eternity. Putting off the old is not the test. It's just the requirement for putting on Christ. You cannot put Christ on over the old. He's not a suit to be worn over sin. By His power, as you confess your sin before Him, He will give you the strength to do what the farmer did with the combine. To make a gut-wrenching choice. I cannot have Christ and my sin too. So sin must go. And you cut it off. And that does not make you a Christian. I got a family member that quit snorting coke. Good for him. He never put on Christ. So now he's a cokeless sinner on his way to hell. They almost never, by the way, simply cut off. They also put on. He exchanged alcoholism for cocaine abuse. When we cut off, we have to put on Christ. Amen. 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 So you don't really walk around maimed. You walk around leaning on Him. How about 1 Peter 2? Tell me when you're there. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 2. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. We're all good now with throwing away our computers, but how are we doing with malice? Told any lies this week? There's no such thing as a white one. Hmm? Hypocrisy? Envy? You're jealous of what somebody has? Slander? Oh my goodness. There are more pastors eating after church than fried chicken. Anybody in here guilty of slander? 
like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. It's not enough to rid yourself of those things. You have to crave the right things. You're blessed when you're poor in spirit because it leads to hunger and thirsting for righteousness. But just being poor in spirit, I meet people all over the world that are poor in spirit. They're crushed by life, crushed by sin, crushed by devotion to their demonic gods. It's a place to start. But it's not the end in and of itself. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness is what fills a person. We need to cut off and leave room to be filled by the living God. As long as we entertain ourselves, as long as we are seekers of pleasure, as long as we have everything else to fulfill us in every other way, then what need do you have of hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Oh, I would love to challenge you, friends, and say whatever you spend the most time with in a day, do a week without it. You know what? You find yourself bored. You find yourself hungry a lot. You find your mind wandering. You simply don't know what to do. Put down your phone, not because you're using pornography, but because you can't put down your phone. Put it down for a week. Go with me to Africa and watch what happens. Your fingers will start to twitch. And you'll ask the Lord for help and find out He's enough even for you Blackberry addicts. I guess that's old school, huh? Blackberry addicts. You tablet PC addicts. Turn me to Ephesians 4. This will be the heart of our message. Are y'all bored? No. I'm convicted. Is it okay if I'm convicted while I preach? I tell you what, at the end of this, one of you can come up, give the altar call, and I'll come repent with you. Is that okay? It's a family meeting. 4, verse 20. Chapter 4 and verse 20. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of Him and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, cut it off, carve it out, circumcise it away, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Whose deceitful desires? Yours. The devil didn't make you do it. Your neighbor didn't make you do it. Your spouse didn't make you do it. And your pastor certainly didn't make you do it. It's your fault. Hey, you say that. It's my fault. It's my fault. I was scared to death you would say it's your fault. <laughs> say it's my fault. It's my fault. See, it's not that hard. Just get before God and say it's my fault. I'm sorry, Lord. Show me how to cut it off. Show me what to put on. I don't want to go into hell with both eyes. How can I get it right? And then have the courage to do what he says. Oh, friends, what a habit to set. Actually obeying the Lord instead of just talking about it. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. One of the things that I love about the scripture is if you don't understand what he's saying, if it feels like a Casper the Ghost warm spiritual moment, if you just get verklept and don't know what it means, read the next verses. It is so practical. Listen to what he says. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully with his neighbor. You put off lying and what do you put on? Truthfulness. Coming into Christ is not not lying. It's speaking truthfully. Oh, man. I skipped the verse, didn't I? Oh, here we go. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must no longer steal, but must work doing something useful with his own hand. Coming into Christ is not, not, it's not giving up being a thief. Praise God, a lot of people have given up being a thief. It's learning to do something useful with your hands. You put off the wickedness and you put on the righteousness. 
It's not enough to put off wickedness. That he may have something to share with those in need. Not just work hard, but work hard for someone else's benefit. That's the mark of a Christian. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. It's not a, you're a Christian, why? They'll know I'm a Christian because I don't curse and they do. How will they know you're not a Jehovah's Witness? How will they not know that you're a hundred other kind of moral things? They will know that you're like Christ when you begin to act like Christ. It's not enough not to curse. You also have to learn to speak edifying words. Now a man can learn not to curse in a moment. But learning how to speak edifying words when someone's being harsh to you, well, that's going to be me 20 years and I've still got quite a ways to go. That's what it means to put on Christ. More specifically, to continually put on Christ. He said, put off the old way, put on the new way, and then he gave you three very specific ways to do it. You've been stealing, don't steal anymore. You've been cursing, you don't curse anymore. He gives us all of the practical ways to do this. Put off your old self. Put on your new. Talk to me about Hebrews 12. Go there for a second. While we're getting a good disciplining as sons, we might as well go to Hebrews 12. Y'all smile with me. I like get it just like you. You know, friends, I don't just know your lives. Don't you know mine? How many of you have been in my house? be honest for a minute before the Lord, can we? There are things that need to be cut out of our lives. There are things that need to be added to our lives. That's why we make it life-changing ministries. It's fantastic. We go to Africa. We go to India. If we act like devils, what good will it be? So we stop acting like devils. And nobody knows and we're hiding in a little corner. What good would that be? I want to do both. I want to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I want to go take his life to the world and show him what can be done if you're just honest in his presence. Are you in Hebrews 12? Yes. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us throw off what hinders and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Yeah. It's not enough to get rid of your baggage. You get rid of your baggage, and then you set out for Jesus. When Jesus healed the man who had been an invalid 38 years by the pool of Siloam, he didn't just heal him and walk away. He healed him and said, now pick up your mat and walk. When he forgave the woman who was caught in adultery in John 8, he didn't just say, your sins are forgiven. Eat a cracker or drop something in the plate. He said, go lead your life of sin. When he healed the man in John 9 who was born blind, he told him after healing him, stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. The inference was go live a better life. I don't want us to simply stop sinning. That's only the place to start. We need to radically amputate. We need to put something off in our life and we need to replace it with something righteous. Amen. Turn with me to Corinthians 5 and this will be our last. Did you know that Passover is coming? Okay, if you didn't know Passover was coming, Easter is also coming. We can thank the second and third century for that particular heresy. You know, people talk if they had a time machine. I would go back and slap the fire out of the early church fathers that were Greeks. That's what I would do. And then I would cut that out of my life. I would repent and I would move on. <laughs> they deliberately separated Easter and Passover. They wanted a different religious calendar than the Jews had. I think they forgot Jesus was Jewish. That is... Uh, I'm not going to teach on that now. Where did I tell you to go? First Corinthians 5? Yes. 
Let's pick up in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and we will draw an end to our message. There's a reason I was talking about Pasach. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. This was so central to Jewish life. When Passover came around, it was also the first day of unleavened bread. When you read the Gospels, they interchange them in the way that we interchange Christmas and Christmas Eve. What you would do on the first day of unleavened bread is your mom would have gone around and hidden all over your house little bread crumbs, pieces of yeast. And your father would take the light of the menorah that symbolized the Spirit of God and the light of His Word. And he would take the children and they would crawl on their hands and knees and they would gather up all those little crumbs everywhere, searching their house for yeast that didn't belong. They would put it in a bag outside the house and burn it. Taking the Passover lamb was also synonymous with spring cleaning. Getting rid of things that didn't belong. See, you have to push out the old yeast so that you can keep the festival of the Passover lamb with a true bread. Amen. I would just like to say I think too many of us have tried to mix the old yeast and the Passover lamb. It's an offense to God. It lessens his character. It says I'm all right just like I am. I'm just going to add a little God to the mix. Get a little religion in my life. There is nothing that is acceptable about us except what has been cut off and replaced now by Christ. Amen. If there is anything good in you, it is Christ being formed in you. It was not there natively. You were not the pretty good old boy that just came to love Jesus. You were a monstrous sinner. And by the grace of God, He showed you that. And you are now cutting pieces out and replacing it with Christ. And so he credits you with all of his righteousness, but you're going to walk in it all the rest of your life. As Peter said, you are receiving the salvation of your souls. This is how a man who is born of God cannot continue to sin. If you do sin, there is someone who will speak to the Father for you. But surely you don't want to treat that conversation lightly, do you? Because he died for your sin. He didn't just die for everybody's sin. He didn't just die for the sin of the person to your left or your right. He died for yours, for your bad attitude, for your envy, for your covetousness, for your lust, for your selfishness. <coughs> he died for that. That's who talks to the Father on your behalf. The one that your sin killed. Well, that's not preached enough, is it? When we frame it in those terms, and you realize that you were responsible, you have just one choice. What will be cut off and what will be put on. In the name of Jesus, y'all stand to your feet.